Hi, welcome to the machine learning pipeline lesson of the course. As you can imagine, in this lesson we are going to talk about the machine learning pipeline, the several steps that are commonly involved when building a machine learning solution. First of all, we have to collect and explore the data we are going to use. Then we can manipulate the available data, for example to remove the possible outliers. Hence, we extract and select features from the data. These will be used by the machine learning algorithm to learn a specific task. The next step is to select, tune and evaluate different machine learning methods to find the most suitable for our problem. Then, we can analyze the predictions of our model to understand whether it is necessary to go to any previous step of the pipeline and change something to improve the performance of our solution. Finally, we can deploy the machine learning model and use it in a real-world scenario. The first thing to do is to think about the data we need to build our machine learning solution. For example, if we want to build a classifier that predicts whether a mail is spam or not, we need a dataset of mail labeled as spam or not spam. The collection of a dataset is a hard and not always feasible process. The problem becomes harder if we have also to annotate each data sample with its corresponding label, called ground throat. Let's think about a scenario in which we need to deploy a machine learning solution to detect the activities performed by an old man in his habitation, to remotely monitor if the patient eats and takes the medicines at the right times. We need to install inside the habitation environmental sensors able to detect the interaction of the person with the fridge, the doors and so on. Then, to collect a dataset, we need to monitor some volunteers for a proper amount of time in this smart environment. The collected data must be labeled through a data annotation process, since we need to know which activity corresponds to a specific sequence of sensors activations. Furthermore, Ideally, we should collect any possible way in which an activity can be performed by a person to produce a good machine learning solution. You can imagine how complex can be the data collection process in this scenario. Sometimes we are lucky and we can find already collected dataset that are suitable for our problem. In any case, we can then explore our dataset through statistical analysis and visualization tools. The data exploration process is useful to understand the main characteristics of the available data, mainly thanks to descriptive and statistics and visualization tools. For example, we can compute the mean value of an attribute or draw a box plot to find the outliers of another attribute. As we have already seen in the previous lesson, we can also compute the statistical correlation between each pair of attributes. The next step of the pipeline consists of some data preprocessing operations. Often, we need to clean the available data. We can remove the outliers of the dataset. Sometimes it could happen that a specific attribute is not available for some entries of the dataset. We can drop the entries containing missing values or we can replace them with the average of the attribute over the whole dataset. When we work with time series of signals, we often apply a filter to reduce the noise of this data. After cleaning, we can transform our data. Sometimes we have to handle the format of the data. For example, we can have the attribute house price encoded as a string in the dataset. In this case, we can cast the attribute to be a float number. Sometimes instead, we need to turn categorical values into numerical ones. This mainly because most of the machine learning models cannot receive as input data like strings. Let's consider an attribute class that encodes the information about the ticket class of a passenger, first, second or third class. We can encode this class with a number instead of a string. Or we can create a different numerical attribute for each of the three classes. The attribute first class will contain one if the passenger has a first class ticket 
zero otherwise. The same idea is applied to the second class and the third class attributes. This kind of encoding is called one-not encoding. A common problem for classification tasks is data balancing. Indeed, the classes of many datasets are not equally represented. For example, we can think about a dataset containing data related to defective and non-defective products. Probably, we will have a lot of samples of non-defective products, but a low number of defective data. In these cases, we can use proper techniques to undersample the most represented classes or oversample the poorly represented ones. Also, the data augmentation process can be used to generate a new synthetic data. In this case, it is done to increase the dataset size and reduce the overfitting. We can think about a classifier that has to detect which animal is represented in an image. We can increase the dataset examples by applying some transformation to the images. In this figure, you can see an example of horizontal flip applied to an image. Another process we can consider is to dimensionally reduce the available data. Dimensionality reduction techniques allow to project high-dimensional data into a lower-dimensional subspace, maintaining the important properties of the original data. This approach sometimes is useful to make the predictive process easier and less challenging. The feature engineering is the next step of our pipeline. Sometimes the dataset already contains features the important properties of the data that can be used by the machine learning method to solve our problem. In other cases, the dataset contains raw data from which we have to extract features. Let's think about a machine learning method that has to predict the age of a person based on his or her voice. A dataset could contain audio files related to the voice of different people. The feature extraction process consists of using domain knowledge to extract from these audio files properties that characterize the human voice. In this way, we make the age prediction process feasible. Typically, raw data are segmented into overlapping windows of an arbitrary length, and then the features are extracted from each of these segmentation windows. Then, we can also apply some transformation to these features. Typically, we have to uniform the values of the attributes with different ranges. For example, we can scale all the attributes values within the interval 0, 1 to enable a fair comparison among them. In some datasets, we need to group values into bins or buckets. For example, we can group age values into age groups. Instead of counting how many people in a dataset are 23 years old and how many of them are 25 years old, we can create the bucket 20s and then count how many people are 20 to 30 years old. Once we have our transformed features, we can select, thanks to proper techniques, the most important features for our problem. This process is used to reduce the overfitting and the training time and to increase the accuracy of our machine learning solution. Note that, with the feature selection process, we choose the most useful available features. During the feature engineering step, we can also leverage dimensionality reduction methods to reduce the number of features, but in such a case, we will create new attributes instead of selecting the most suitable among the available ones. The next step of the pipeline is the model selection process. Here, we have to choose among candidate models which is the most suitable for our purpose. The candidate models depend on the constraints related to our dataset and problem. For example, some models may perform very poorly on high-dimensional data, and if we cannot dimensionally reduce our dataset, we cannot consider these models as candidates. Usually, candidate models are chosen based on state-of-the-art solutions already proposed for problems that fall into the same research field we are approaching. Each machine learning model has a set of hyperparameters that need to be tuned. These are parameters that must be manually set because they are not automatically learned by the model during the learning process. We need to define a method to evaluate the goodness of a specific model. 
Thanks to this method, we can then set the best hyperparameters for each model and choose the most suitable tune model for our problem. Let's consider a classification problem. Usually, the dataset is divided into a training set and a test set. A model can be trained on the training set and then we can evaluate, thanks to proper matrix and scores, its performance and generalization capabilities on unseen data, the test set. However, we can use the test set to tune the hyperparameters of the models. Indeed, in such a case, we would use the test set to optimize our models, so we cannot use at the same time the test set data to evaluate the generalization capabilities of our solution. For this reason, the training set is further divided to obtain the validation set. Now we can consider different combinations of the hyperparameters of a model and train it for each of these combinations on the training data. The goodness of each combination of hyperparameters is evaluated on the validation data. In this way, we can tune and optimize each single candidate model. Then, each optimized model is evaluated on the test set to find the most suitable solution for our problem. The best model will be then retrained on the whole dataset in order to maximize its performance. Now, we have another problem to face. This approach is not enough robust, since we could intentionally split the dataset in order to obtain a test set that contains data examples on which our model has great performance. For this reason, it is very important to use the keyfold cross-validation technique. Data are split into k equally sized subset, called folds. At each iteration of the process, one fold is used as the test set, while the other folds are used as the training set. The evaluation matrix are as always computed on the test set. The scores obtained at each iteration are then averaged to obtain the overall performance of the model on our data. Now we can talk about the possible matrix we can compute on the validation and test sets. Let's consider a binary classification problem and the possible cases we can find. True positives are the cases in which we have a positive prediction and the ground truth is positive. For example, we detect a dog in an image that contains a dog. False positives are the cases in which we have a positive prediction but the ground truth is negative. True negatives are the cases in which we have a negative prediction and the ground truth is negative. For example, we correctly detect that an image does not contain any dog. Finally, false negatives are the cases in which we have a negative prediction but the actual label is true. Based on these values, we can compute the following matrix. The most common matrix is accuracy, which computes the percentage of correct predictions. Actually, this is not a very robust metric to evaluate the performance of a model. Let's consider an imbalanced dataset that contains 100 dog images. 95 images contain a dog, while 5 images do not contain any animal. If we always predict that the input image contains a dog, the accuracy will be of 95%. We will think to have a very good classifier that actually just always predicts the same thing. The precision is used to understand how many positive predictions are actually positive. This is useful when it is important to have a low number of false positives. For instance, an email spam detector should maximize the precision, since we don't want to predict as spam mails that are not spam. The recall is used to find how many times the model missed a true prediction among all the positive instances. This is an important metric when we want to minimize the false negatives. For example, a disease detector has to minimize the cases in which we have a patient with a disease but the model did not recognize it. Finally, we can consider the F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. This is useful to consider the contribution of both these measures. Let's move on. We can now see some possible hyperparameters tuning techniques we can use during the model selection process. Grid search is the most basic method we can consider. 
With this approach, we just evaluate a model for some possible combinations of its hyperparameters, and then we select the model with the best results. With the random search technique instead, we consider statistical distribution for each hyperparameter. The combinations are built by randomly sampling the value of each hyperparameter from its distribution. Finally, with the Bayesian optimization technique, at each iteration of the process we choose an hyperparameter combination that we expect to be optimal based on the results obtained in the previous steps. During the model selection step, you have always to consider that our purpose is to maximize the performance of the models on the test set. Remember that when a model has great results on the training set but bad performance on the test set, this means that we are facing the overfitting problem. The next step of the pipeline is called model analysis. Here we should deeper analyze the behavior of the selected model on the test set to understand how it will work on unseen data in a real world scenario. Let's see a couple of possibilities we have. In a classification problem, for example, based on the metrics we have discussed before, we can build a confusion matrix. These metrics will tell us which are the classes that are confused by our model on the testing data. In this example, classes C and D are never confused, while classes A and B tend to be confused. This is very useful to more deeply analyze the behavior of the model we have selected. Another idea is to use explainable AI techniques to discover why the machine learning model made a specific prediction. In this figure, you can see a visualization technique used to explain the predictions of a convolutional neural network. The image on the left is the input given to the model. It detected the presence of a dog and the image on the right shows which are the components that mostly contributed to its prediction. Sometimes, thanks to this kind of analysis, we can understand how to improve the overall performance of our solution by changing something in the previous steps of the pipeline. For instance, we could discover that our model tends to confuse two classes of our dataset. So we can purposely collect new data related to these classes to help the classifier in distinguishing them. The last step of the machine learning pipeline is model deployment. Here, we have to train the most suitable model on the whole dataset, and then we can use it in a real-world scenario. Every preprocessing operation and the feature extraction we have applied to the data used to train this model must be applied also to the data we will use to obtain new predictions in the real world. So, we arrived also at the end of this lesson. See you in the last session of this course, where we will see how to develop our first machine learning pipeline to build a machine learning model that predicts the age of a person based on his or her voice.